Good evening, everyone. Uh, a very warm welcome to this special hustings event this evening. Uh, of course, we're here because uh, there's a contest underway to find Scotland's next First Minister. And we have an opportunity this evening, a golden opportunity, to focus in uh, in some depth around an issue of real concern and interest to all of us on this call on the next move Scotland should be taking uh, to reduce and, in fact, to solve uh, poverty and tackle inequality. Uh, I'm Jim McCormick. I'm the Chief Exec of the Robertson Trust, and together with our partners at Poverty Alliance, it's our pleasure to host this evening's event. First of all, an apology for the delay in getting started while we made sure we'd all candidates in, in place and briefed and delighted to say um, we're welcoming all three candidates uh, this evening. Thank you very much for making time in a pretty hectic schedule to join us and over 400 people have signed up to this webinar as a, as a sign of the interest in these issues. Um, this evening there's no glare of television cameras you might be relieved to, to hear and to know, but we will have a set of very focused questions. And I think this event will be fizzing with ideas on what Scotland should be doing next. Very briefly then, by way of introduction, I mean, the Robertson Trust is a truly independent um, funder for Scotland. We're just over 60 years old. And our mission across this decade to 2030 is to fund, support and champion those who are building solutions to poverty and trauma in Scotland. Um, this evening, like many other nights in Scotland, there is in the population, in every community, there is hunger and there is cold. There is anxiety and fear. There are people struggling to keep their heads above the waterline. Um, there's all of that, but our job collectively is also to ensure there is hope. I say that because we know that poverty in Scotland today is not just real and damaging and costly for a million of our fellow citizens. It is also solvable in the sense that Scotland should be not just the only part of the UK with statutory targets to solve child poverty, but um, becoming alongside the best countries in the OECD, many of them close to our shores in terms of having a low rate of poverty and a very low, low rate of long-term and enduring and deep poverty in particular. Uh, we know in recent years the damage that COVID and the cost of living, we can factor in uh, austerity before that and the long run effects of Brexit, some of which are already very visible in our job market and beyond. We could talk about the heart, heartache and hardship those factors have and continue to uh, create the gale force winds that face low-income families in Scotland and those just, just, just beyond the safety zone for whom poverty is never far away. But we also know that action by governments, by enlightened employers, and even by some landlords over this period, not to mention public services at every level of society, have created um, protections and buffer zones and at times, there have also been more than that. There have been springboards put in place, not just safety nets. And we need to see more of that consistently. The uplift in universal credit through the pandemic did a lot to stop poverty from rising during those years. Its withdrawal created a cliff edge. In Scotland, we are fortunate to have had a government and, in fact, a parliamentary consensus behind an ambitious tackling poverty plan for children and families. We see that in the Scottish Child Payment, 
which has done a lot to protect low-income families here. Um, it's had to do a lot of compensating for the withdrawal of support elsewhere and in the face of a cost of living crisis. Um, but it tells us that we can take action. It does make a difference. There's a lot more we can do. We should take heart from the efforts that have been um, put in place already. When we talk about a life free from poverty with people who experience it and with the organizations who serve the people in places we're all here to support, we know that people talk about adequate incomes and lower costs. They talk about getting out of unmanageable debt and arrears. They talk about the peace of mind of being, being just being able to pay your bills without a shadow hanging over you. But they do more than that. They talk about what it feels like to be in poverty. They talk about um, not being judged, not being stigmatized and being free from the mental stresses and strains of not having enough money. We believe that poverty and therefore solving poverty cannot be measured only in pounds. It has to be measured in the potential which is either wasted or realized and in the prospects and life chances that are either restricted or opened up to many more of our population. So this agenda has to be about more than the Scottish child payment. It has to be about social security in the round and housing and work and much more besides. Who is it for and where is it for? In many ways, we need to have a plan for Scotland that is for all of us that we all feel a stake in, whether we're in poverty now or in the past or not at all. It has to serve children and families. It has to serve disabled people and carers. It has to serve single adults and women. And it has to serve minority communities, all of whom face a higher risk and burden of poverty in the here and now as in the past. So this evening, let's all put our heads together. Let's, of course, bring scrutiny and challenge to those who wish to be Scotland's next First Minister. Let's do it in a spirit of seeking solutions and identifying the progress we must make in the years ahead. I'm really looking forward to it. I'm now going to pass the baton on to Peter Kelly from Poverty Alliance who'll be our chair this evening. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jim, um, for that eloquent introduction. We're going to move straight on to uh, the hustings now. And this is the, the point of this evening's uh, gathering is to um, uh, submit our three candidates for the next First Minister to some, as Jim said, searching questions about uh, their priorities for addressing poverty and inequality in Scotland. Um, I'm sure many of you on the call tonight will be familiar with how hustings work. We'll, we'll hear a short introduction from each of our candidates, uh, and then we'll be turning over to uh, the questions that have been submitted um, for tonight's event uh, and, and putting those to each of the candidates in turn. So no further ado, I'm going to uh, kick straight off and ask uh, if we could hear Firstly, from Kate Forbes about your priorities for addressing poverty. Well, thanks very much, Peter, and thanks for having us along. Um, at least two of us, but I think all of us would agree, but at least two of us last night said that we wanted our uh, approach or our, our first ministerial job to be judged on the basis of how far we went in eradicating poverty last night. And one of the challenges with uh, an election like this is that it doesn't leave that much space to get into the, the substance of any issue. So I'm uh, extremely uh, enthused by the fact that we get to do that tonight. But I do want to say at the outset how important Jim's comment is that we put our heads together to seek solutions. 
because one of the biggest dangers, I think, in our approach to eradicating poverty is that it is top down, policy driven and bureaucratic, when actually the causes and the symptoms of poverty are so multifaceted that it really does require us all to be working together in lockstep. The third sector, the private sector, particularly when we come on to wages, as well as the public sector, working together to identify solutions and putting people at its heart. And whilst targets are really important uh, in terms of outputs and uh, financial inputs are really important in terms of how much money we spend on budgets, neither of those actually capture the human impact of poverty. And I come at this, I suppose, growing up in a very different country where I was exposed to absolute poverty on a daily basis. So I, as some of you will know, grew up in India where my parents were working with people who were classified as being in absolute poverty. So where children didn't go to school for need of work and adults were working basically to be able to afford the next meal. And my exposure to that absolute poverty taught me several things. One is that poverty is not inevitable. Poverty is by design of states that have failed and economies that have failed because there is nothing inevitable about poverty. The second thing is that poverty is the root of every other issue that we are grappling with as a government. It is the root of, for example, health inequalities. It is the root of loneliness and isolation. It is the root of, um, of, 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 of many of the mental health challenges that we face. Now, that means that if we are able to tackle uh, poverty and the root causes, then we are able to make progress on, on other things. And the last thing I it, it, it revealed to me is the multi-generational nature of poverty, that actually what's required is for us to break that multi-generational impact. And the grave danger I think that we're in right now in terms of the decisions that are being made by government, where we are with the economy and the cost of living crisis, is that we see a profound reversal of some of the progress that's been made in recent years, where we are increasing the likelihood of people who are on the fringes of poverty being plunged into poverty and the multi-generational impact that will have on, on, on children. So we know that in terms of where we're at right now in Scotland, we cannot ignore the grave social economic inequalities in Scotland. One in four children are in poverty, as we know, uh, but the, the gap in life expectancy between the most deprived areas and the least deprived areas, it tells its own story, 24 years, well, over 24 years, is, is huge. And that uh, reveals, well, that's a figure that reveals what we're, we're grappling with right now. So very, very quickly, because I think we'll get into the substance of this and the questions, what do I think need to be done? I'm going to say three things in one minute. First of all, we need to redistribute wealth. To do that, you need to create wealth in a way that doesn't exacerbate inequalities. So that means it's supporting economic growth in a way that doesn't exacerbate inequalities. Two, it is ensuring that people have more, uh, more income, basically. To deal with that, we need to ensure that there are well-paid, secure jobs uh, and that we reduce costs, particularly in a year where we know that disposable income is falling by at least 7% in real terms. Um, and three, we need to make sure that our public services are preventative in nature and not just dealing with the consequences and the symptoms of poverty. And we've been talking about preventative, uh, preventive, preventative approach to public services for as long as I can recall, and I still don't think we're there. And to do that, we need to get away again from the inputs and the targets and actually create a much more public centred approach, to, sorry, a person centred approach. To do that, we need to empower teams on the front line. We need to give them the freedom, the flexibility over funding and decision making to actually deliver the services that people require. And with that, Peter, it's back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. Um, I'll move straight on now to Ash. You have your five minutes now. 
Thanks very much. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm here tonight to talk to you about my vision for a better Scotland, and that would be a Scotland where poverty is not just an afterthought, but a top priority, and a Scotland where everyone has the opportunity to succeed, regardless of their background. And we all know that poverty is a very serious issue in Scotland. One in five people in the country live in relative poverty before housing costs, and that number rises to one in four after housing costs. And for children, the situation is even worse. Around 24% of children in Scotland live in relative poverty before housing costs, and after housing costs is 26%, which is quite simply unacceptable. But I believe we can change this and we can create a Scotland where everyone has access to the resources that they need to succeed. But it must start with our priorities and the way we direct our economy. My vision for Scotland includes investing in renewable energy and creating high paying jobs in the sector and the supply chain. We have the potential to be a leader in renewable energy. And that not only benefits the planet, obviously, but the people and our future as well. And we need very much to focus on creating high paying jobs and supporting workers through strong unions and collective bargaining. And we must invest in accessible, high quality education and support vulnerable children through things like free school meals. Um, no child in Scotland should ever go to school hungry. So my plan for a better Scotland is based on learning from successful models like Norway and adapting these strategies to fit Scotland's unique circumstances. I believe that we can build a country that's fair, just and prosperous for all. And I think that we can make that vision a reality. I would say, to my mind, though, we are limited in terms of what we can do under devolution. So I think that the real opportunity for us in how we make poverty um, you know, we eradicate it altogether in Scotland would be with all the powers that we can use um, when we're independent. But there's still things we can do under devolution as well. And I'm sure we'll get into speaking about some of them this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ash. And finally, over to you, Hamza, for your uh, introduction. Thanks so much, uh, Peter, to you, to Jim, to the Poverty Alliance, to the Robertson Trust. I mean, two organisations I've been uh, proud to work with uh, in the past, uh, often at local MSP level, uh, as well as uh, within government. And I uh, want to congratulate all the organisations on here that are doing phenomenal work in relation to not just reducing poverty, but eradicating it, because that has to be the mission. That has to be the ambition. That has to be the goal that we don't just want to reduce poverty, but absolutely aim to, to, to eradication of poverty. And, and the Poverty Alliance, uh, of course, every every year uh, since I think 2013, uh, you, you'll correct me, uh, Peter, have challenged Poverty Week. Um, and I think we shouldn't just be challenging poverty. I think we should be angry about poverty. And this is why I, I suspect, and I would want to speak for, for, for my fellow colleagues, but I think it would be a fair assumption to say that's why that we all got into politics, because we're angry at what we see. We're angry at the levels of poverty that in a country that is energy rich as Scotland, we have people who are fuel poor, that we have a country that has the wealth that the UK does and Scotland does, that we have people living in poverty, choosing between heating and eating, literally in a country as energy rich as Scotland. And the UK is an outlier. You can look at comparative countries uh, in Western Europe in particular, and you can see that the UK is more unequal and is poorer. It is an outlier because of over a decade of austerity, because of Brexit, because of the choices uh, that have been made uh, by uh, the UK government. Uh, and for me, um, and I also want to congratulate the, the Robinson Trust too, because uh, I've known the Robinson Trust for many, many years and often haranguing them about funding organisations, my constituency, which they, they fund many of them who are doing excellent work and challenging poverty. But of course, the story of the Robinson Trust, you know, the, the, the vision of the three sisters, you know, honesty, integrity and willingness to help the poor, uh, that is something that they've carried on for, for decades and decades. But that in itself shows you the problem for decades, for decades, since I think the 1960s, since the Robertson Trust uh, has been uh, around. And we have made some progress for sure, but there's no doubt that we have not 
we we need to go further. We must go further. And whoever the next leader of the SNP and the next first minister is, I think it must be their defining mission to reduce, if not eradicate poverty, but certainly reduce it substantially. Uh, from, from, from my perspective, I see poverty, I'm afraid, far too often in my constituency in Glasgow Pollock, but also as health secretary. And I agree with my colleagues' comments, poverty is at the root of every single challenge we face in government. We see it in health, uh, it is no surprise uh, to anybody in this call that poorer health outcomes are linked directly to poverty. But I was just a secretary. Again, unfortunately, the same pattern. Those who ended up in our justice system time and time again, poverty, trauma at the heart of it and at the root of it. Transport, when I was transport secretary, again, those who struggle to access public transport those in poverty. So what do we do about it? I won't list all the things the Scottish Government uh, has done. We know about the Social Security system uh, based at Social Security Scotland, the five family payments. You talked about Scottish child payment, free school meals, et cetera, et cetera. We'll get into the detail of all of that. But I agree strongly with my colleagues. Uh, for all of us who believe in independence, uh, I don't doubt uh, those powers, particularly the financial levers that are needed, could help us uh, demonstrably, but that doesn't abdicate our responsibility to what we need to do now. So what do we need to do? Continue with progressive taxation. For me, that is so important in terms of the well-being economy and society I want to see. I want to continue in relation to that progressive uh, taxation journey. Uh, I think it's hugely important. When, second thing we have to do is help to get people into work. Now, not just create the jobs and say, right, get into work, but actually do what we're some of what we're doing. So make sure they get the wraparound support to help secure them into employment. That's why we've got to, and I've committed to this accelerating um, childcare and expansion of childcare to one and two year olds, because again, that is good for families, but also helps our economy. Uh, and the last thing uh, I'll say is make sure that our, our resources are targeted to those that need it the most. And again, Scottish Child Payments, an example of that. Uh, but there are times where I think we've spent money where it could be more targeted towards the, those that are the most vulnerable. And the very last thing I say, Peter, because you've given me the indication uh, the time is up, is we must not ignore the intersectionality that exists. Uh, we know that uh, when it comes to those in minority ethnic communities, those with disabilities, for example, uh, women, uh, we know those that live in certain postcodes, there's an intersectionality that is there and in, 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 in rooted in, in, in poverty. And what we have to make sure we are doing, and this sounds like a very techy and perhaps even a boring point, but our data collection I've noticed in government around these issues is not at the standard I would expect it to be. So I think that is going to be incredibly important that helps us target our resources. I'll leave it there, Peter, because I've probably gone slightly okay. over time. Look forward to a good discussion. Thank you very much, Hamza. Thank you all of you for, for your introductions. I think we've, we've certainly got a sense of the breadth of the, the issues that we need to dis discuss tonight. Um, I would just remind all of our participants that um, everyone was asked um, when, you, when you signed up for this to submit a question. I'm really pleased that we've had more than 60 questions um, submitted. Now um, we can talk as quickly as we, we like, but I don't think we're going to get through all those 60 questions. So we've tried to summarise and we've picked some that, that represent other questions and we'll try and get through as many as we can uh, this evening. And please feel free to submit more questions on the Q&A. We'll be trawling those and uh, my colleague will, will ask some of those questions a little bit later. Um, but I want to start with one question that I think um, uh, has come up repeatedly. One issue that's come up repeatedly in the in the previous hustings that we've seen televised and, and has already been mentioned by all three candidates tonight, and that relates to the economy. Uh, the way that our economy works is obviously fundamental to our ability to address poverty. It, it locks, the economy can both lock some people in poverty and also give others the opportunity to have access to more than they could ever possibly need. Uh, we know in the past that a growing economy has also been ac accompanied by growing poverty. Um, so how will you ensure, as First Minister, how will you ensure that economic growth does not simply deepen the inequalities that exist in our country and avoid perhaps some of the mistakes of the past? That's a question that's been submitted by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, but also reflected in many others as well. And I will put that question firstly um, to Ash. Okay, thank you. 
So I would agree, I would agree with that. I don't think we can grow our way out of poverty. And the reason that I say that is because GDP has risen enormously since the war, but reductions in poverty have not shrunk comparably. Um, so if, if a growing GDP was enough, it would have worked already. So I think we know that's discounted. That isn't going to work. We have to do things in a different way. And the stats that I've got here, which um, hopefully are correct, um, since 2000, Scottish GB, GDP growth has grown by 40%, but there were one in four kids in poverty then, and they still are now. So we know that that, that link between growing GDP and poverty, um, it just it isn't working. So I think we know redistribution of wealth, I think, has a place here, um, but I don't see it as a major part of the picture. I think it's a part of the picture, but it's not the, the majority of it. Um, and I think the way, for me, the fundamentals to this is the way we direct and organize our economy. And the way that it, it's working at the moment, it isn't, gonna, it isn't gonna cut it for me. It needs to be changed. You know, we've got things like free ports, you know, that's big businesses with low regulation, and that's not gonna work for us in this sense. You know, we've got Scotland handing over our energy resources to foreign corporations. They take the, you know, the supply chain, the manufacturing that's in China, that's not gonna get us to where we want to go. We need economic reform. So what we need to be doing is creating um, a thriving, productive domestic economy, which is adding value. So not just selling things that we've bought somewhere else and not adding that value. We need to be making things, growing things, creating, designing, innovating, all that sort of stuff. And if we can keep that into um, an economy that's largely domestically owned, so we're keeping the supply chain and the wealth locally, so that's local wealth building, and we're intervening in order to shape the economy into the kind of economy that, that we want. And I think we would need to do that through an industrial strategy. And I don't think that's something that we've seen for a while. Then I think that is how we're going to really steer a course in the direction that we want to go in. Um, obviously, there's um, space in here as well for mitigations. Um, so I suppose that would be things that we've probably touched on already tonight. So um, examples, I suppose, would be the free school meals. Um, you know, maybe having social workers or psychologists embedded in schools, cash payments, that'd be like the child payment, um, food, you know, funding food banks, etc. Now, we can't do all of those things under devolution, so you would have to pick which ones, you know, that you wanted to. So um, I, I, I can tell I'm getting told that I'm answering my, my answers too long, so I'll stop there. Thanks very much, Ash. I think some of those those points that you raised there towards the end will definitely return to in terms of free school meals and so on. But if we could maybe uh, now turn to Hamza. Thanks so much. I'll, I'll do my best to keep it brief because I know how many questions uh, there are. So my, one of my central policies has been that I want to embed and build on the well-being uh, economy, an economy that works for the people as opposed to the other way around. So putting fairness, giving, giving fairness, giving happiness, giving health, equal weight, more weight actually than, than economic growth because we know that trickle-down economics has been discredited and we know it just simply doesn't work. So that's why I think for me progressive taxation is so important. Creating jobs for sure but making sure we give the wraparound support um, for that. Uh, the SDUC have produced a, a really good report, a really challenging report for government to look at in terms of how we might use um, uh, progressive taxation but also wealth taxes uh, and I've said to the STUC I'm very open to exploring uh, some of the ideas um, in there because I think we can go further in terms of progressive uh, taxation. It's right that those who earn the most, like government ministers, should pay the most uh, to be able to invest in our public services. If John Swinney hadn't made that decision around progressive taxation, for example, we wouldn't have a billion pounds extra to put into the health service uh, in 23-24. Um, for me, uh, it's also linked absolutely to, to, to how we ensure uh, that profit which is made off our land and our resources, including renewable energy, uh, is not just put in the pockets of shareholders, but actually comes back to the people. So again, one of my announcements has been to ensure uh, when it comes to future leases of Scotland, it's not just a lease, there's at least a 10% equity stake. So we get the profits or a portion of the profits uh, back into communities and redistribute redistributing communities. Last thing I'd say, and our powers on this are limited somewhat, but we absolutely have to stop um, uh, people uh, allowing wealth to leave the country uh, when actually it should be paid in taxation uh, here. Now, I don't think the UK government goes nearly, uh, nearly far enough in relation to closing some of those tax loopholes. I would like to see more of that power in Scotland's hands so we can try to stop uh, that. So wellbeing economy, progressive taxation, making sure that uh, uh, the profits of, of our land uh, come back into uh, Scotland and into the communities of Scotland.
Scotland, and then as I say, uh, making sure that that wealth uh, is appropriately taxed and doesn't just get to leave the country uh, would be would be kind of four of my uh, top issues in relation to the economy. Thanks very much. Um, and same question, Kate. Thanks. Well, never was there a truer word spoken that national growth in our economy certainly does not uh, eradicate poverty. Um, I couldn't agree more the, with that. Um, ultimately, what we need to see is uh, people being paid enough to live on. And we know that if national growth doesn't eradicate poverty, so neither, so when it comes to the situation we're in right now, where you've got inflation, where you've got cost of living, you have the fact that real incomes are, are falling in real terms by, as I said already, by 7%. So on one hand, although you can't just assume that national growth will eradicate poverty, so also we have to grapple with the fact that no growth at the moment is exacerbating the issue that people find themselves in. And so my point here is that it's less about measuring national outcomes in terms of GDP growth, and it's more about measuring uh, individual uh, income levels to ensure that people can, um, can, can afford uh, the, the costs of living. And that, for me, all boils down to the arguments around a living wage, that for too many people in Scotland, those who are in work, they are not earning enough, not because they aren't working enough, but because they aren't being paid enough for their work, they aren't earning enough in order to uh, be able to afford bills. So you can have a carer. I know one personally who happens to be related to me who is working two jobs but can't afford uh, the bills that are coming down the track. That is both a problem with the, 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 the level of pay, but it's also a problem with the costs. So my point here is rather than measuring national GDP levels, we need to be measuring uh, the, 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 the average um, pay and the average wages to ensure that people are paid. And I think we need to completely turn the economy on its head because too often the most important jobs in society are not rewarded and recompensed for the valuable work that they do, like care. There's surely nothing more important than caring for our elderly um, uh, relatives as one example, and yet they are not paid uh, uh, sufficiently. And the second thing I would briefly say is exactly what Hamza has said, which is about the wellbeing economy. Now, the wellbeing economy you can't forget about the economy part. So you do need to have a healthy, growing, prosperous economy. But the outcomes that we're measuring are not in terms of GDP growth. The outcomes that we're measuring is in terms of people's health, in terms of their happiness, in terms of community cohesion. Um, and these are, are critical elements, as Jim said at the outset. Uh, poverty isn't just in terms of income levels. There is also poverty of, of, of loneliness, of isolation um, and of, of, of stigma. So there's two parts to my answer. Thanks very much. And thank you all for, for those answers. Maybe if I could maybe try and tease out a little bit more, because um, some of the questions that we've had, so we've had uh, questions from Fraser of Allender Institute and, and others going around uh, key dimensions of some of the points that you've, you've raised already, so around progressive taxation. So, so trying to drill into this a bit more specifically, what I'm not going to ask you to write your next budget, your first budget or your autumn statement, but, but what, what would you be looking to change? How would you look to build on uh, perhaps some of the, the changes that have been made uh, already? Um, and what would this, um, from Fraser of Allender Institute, what would a, a transformation of the economy, which has already been suggested in the last child poverty uh, del delivery plan, what would that actually look like to you and, and specific policies? What would be different under your uh, leadership as First Minister? And at this time, I'll come to you, Hamza, for, for the first answer there. And if you could keep your answers as brief as possible, it would be great. Yeah, I think for, for me, I referenced the STUC report. Now, there's, I wouldn't put everything that the STUC put in the report uh, necessarily to, to, to into, into implementation. But for example, the STUC report says, well, is there a, another 
uh, tax band between uh, the, 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 the higher rate and, and, and the top rate to look at for those that earn £75,000 to I think it's £125,000 uh, was, was their suggestion. I think that's a suggestion that's worth exploring. And I think, again, from my top of my head in the STUC report, that, that talks about bringing in an additional £200 million, which could be really essential in our fight against poverty. So these are not ideas that I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely committed to, but I'm looking at and exploring and like to see what more we can do in progressive taxation. I think there's a general support out there from people in Scotland that those that earn the most uh, should absolutely uh, pay the most in terms of transforming uh, the economy. Again, for me, it's about ensuring that we have that wraparound support to get people into work. So not just creating the jobs, which is important, but that's why my flagship policy is the acceleration of uh, childcare. And then I go to the last point that I made um, uh, previously in my comment, which is ensuring that those who make profit off Scotland's land uh, or wind or sea, that we get a share of that profit so we can reinvest it back into fighting and hopefully eradicating poverty. Great, thank you. Um, and to Kate this time. So I, I won't talk about income tax because I, I do support progressive taxation when it comes to income tax, but obviously that's not the only tax that we have uh, available in Scotland and the one that really needs uh, reform is non-domestic rates. So non-domestic rates was reformed in part uh, in the last parliament, but um, to a very limited degree. And I don't think non-domestic rates in any way uh, reflect the way the economy works. So, for example, you can have a highly, highly successful business with a very, very, very high turnover, but in a small premises, paying very little in non-domestic rates or sometimes nothing. And you can have a very large business in terms of property size but which is not particularly profitable, paying huge amounts. So I think we also need to apply progressive taxation to some of our other taxes, and that will be through uh, reform. So non-domestic rates raises just over £2 billion in Scotland, so it's it's significant. In terms of what transformation of the economy uh, looks like, I am going to sound like a broken record, I think, by the end of the session. But for me, transformation of the economy leads to work paying. In other words at a time where unemployment is really low and yet people are in work in multiple jobs and can't afford to live, there's something completely wrong with that. And it's about ensuring that businesses, sectors, industries must pay a fair wage. No ifs, no buts. Right across society, from hospitality to construction, you pay a fair wage. Uh, and that includes fair terms and conditions so that people can earn enough to live. Great, thank you. And finally, Ash. Yes, obviously employment law, you know, that's reserved, so we don't have the powers to can compel companies to, to, to pay that. So I guess we're looking at what we can do under devolution and then hopefully if we get independence, what more we could do under an independent country. So at the moment, um, the stats, two thirds of those in poverty have at least one parent working. So we're back again to, you know, jobs, we need jobs that pay well. Um, but I think I'm back to the point that I was making earlier that we have to grow and shape the economy in the direction that we want. So if we just get lots of, you know, multinational companies in that are paying minimum wage, um, they're not investing in the local area, they're just taking that money and they're taking it out of the economy. That isn't creating the kind of economy that we want. You know, we want that local wealth building. And, and essentially, I suppose the way to sum that up is we want economic development rather than just economic growth. So um, a couple of things I've been talking about um, over the last few weeks is creating a public energy company. So that's something that I think with the high energy costs that we've got at the moment, I think we can all see that that might be a way forward in this situation. And also um, heavy investment into renewables. So things like um, wave and tidal technology, primarily because that opens up us for lots of skilled jobs, but also if we can do it in such a way that we keep the supply chain here, and we can keep that money in the Scottish economy, which I think is really key. Thank you. So I want to move on now. Um, the economy is, is one side of how we tackle poverty. The other key tool that we have is around our social security system. So I want to ask, and, and if you could keep your answers to, to two minutes, and if we can, we'll ask some supplementaries as well. Ask, um, we've had, had multiple questions around social security um, tonight. I want to ask, what are your priorities for continuing to develop the Scottish social security system 
and this time I'll come to you first, Kate. Thanks. So in two minutes, I think we have made huge progress and there's probably two commitments I would make to build on that incredible progress. And I think, you know, it, it, it does reflect well on the Scottish people that we have tried to put dignity at the heart. First of all, is making sure that we do not put unintended barriers up to people accessing it. In other words, making sure that the processes to access it are as dignified as the principles that underpin it. Uh, we, we know that there's always a tendency in the public sector to over bureaucratize things, create too many hurdles in terms of application processes, but to make it as accessible as possible so we maximize the eligibility of it, that people can access it easily and with dignity. And the second thing is to continue to be able to fund a fairer approach. And to be able to fund a fairer approach, we need to, going back to the earlier comment, grow our economy, expand our tax base, ensure there's enough public revenue to reinvest. Um, and certainly as somebody who's been looking at the figures over the last few years when it comes to uh, investing in our social security systems, in order to continue putting dignity at its heart, uh, and having a far more generous uh, system, and I use that word intentionally in contrast with, with the UK, whereas we'd always like it to be as, um, as, as generous as possible, then we do need to make sure that there's a public revenue uh, as part of, of, of growing our economy. Thank you very much. And if we could turn now to Ash, so priorities for Social Security. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, obviously, with the development of Social Security Scotland, um, it has, you know, given us an opportunity to express, I think, Scottish values through that system, which I think was created with different underlying principles, perhaps, than the one that we've seen as part of the whole of the UK. And we do want it to be very easy. We want it to be very simple for people to use and fair. Um, I can't tell you on the constituency side how many constituents I have coming to see me, you know, who are talking about the UK welfare system. And about how arbitrary some of the decisions are and you know the sort of situation that plunges them into and they're you know basically desperate so that's not good so i'd like obviously if we are working towards becoming an independent country we'll take on more and more of those social security benefits and we can bring more of them into the scottish system which i think would be positive um obviously we've had the scottish child payment i think that's been very important i think many people have described it as a game changer and um but i was looking at some statistics here and it was saying that last year, a thousand children were so malnourished that they had to be treated in ER. I mean, that's just, you know, it's terrible that in modern Scotland, and I didn't um, know this figure until someone pointed this out to me quite recently, you know, it's terrible in modern Scotland, they were actually in that situation. So clearly things like the, the Scottish child payment are having an impact on that. But, you know, there's obviously more that we need to do um, to get away from, you know, quite obviously a terrible situation like that with children in Scotland being malnourished. Thank you, Ash. And over to you, Humza. Um, so a uh, couple of points I may agree with my colleagues around the fact that uh, Social Security Scotland has dignity, fairness uh, and compassion at its heart. We must never, ever, ever lose that uh, ethos. We know very different to the UK government's benefit system, which I'm afraid uh, far too often is rooted in suspicion as opposed to uh, attempting to, to help people. So removing that barrier and ensuring it's accessible as possible. A uh, couple, couple of things, if I may. Um, I think the focus has to be uh, on ensuring that we continue to uprate those uh, benefits by inflation because we know how high inflation is. Obviously, we've made a commitment to do that for April uh, 23. Um, we know those 13 uh, benefits uh, are incredibly important to people, but making sure they keep in line with inflation for me, I think, is a significant priority given the way inflation uh, uh, is. I would like a continued focus on carers, um, in particular on paid carers. Obviously, you'll know about the, our carers' uh, support payment and the ambition uh, to have that fully rolled out uh, to replace carers' allowance uh, by spring 24, I think, is, is, uh, is, is the ambition. But certainly, if we can do it even earlier than that, uh, I think we should be looking to, to do that. But I think the, the focus has to be on carers, those with a disability, and children uh, for me. So that's where I see uh, the main priorities for Social Security Scotland. Thanks very much. And a, a very quick, if possible, very quick um, supplementary question on Social Security. We know that the, the system we have in Scotland is, is makes up a small part of people's social entitlement to Social Security. How would you work with the UK government to ensure that people were able to get the best out of the Social Security system as it is at the moment? 
Um, and if we could come to Kate, firstly, for your response, as brief as possible. So this is where I think we need to actually work collaboratively with charities, organisations, and dare I say, other parties to maximise the pressure on the UK government to make it fairer, but also to ensure that, for example, it's uprated in line with inflation uh, so that it covers uh, the, the costs that are increasing as part of uh, the cost of living, um, if I've understood your question correctly. Thank you. Great. And same question to Hamza. So, I mean, I've had um, a number of different roles in government ten, ten and ten and a half years, and I have to say in the health role in particular when dealing with the UK government, uh, I've made sure that the relationship is as collaborative and constructive as possible. Now, we've got ideological differences, very clear, everybody knows that, um, but actually the relationships between the health secretaries is a collaborative one, and, and I think I would use the skills that I've got to try to, because I agree with Kate, I mean, it's got to be a, you know, we've got to, of course, put them under pressure, but frankly, I found uh, on these issues, uh, as much as we can create a consensus amongst other political parties that use our Westminster group, uh, make sure we harness their talents, uh, and, and, and work with other political parties to put that pressure on the UK government um, uh, to, to, to do the right thing, um, I think is, is, is the best approach to take in, in this regard. Thank you. And finally, Ash. Thanks, yeah. I mean, um, we need to do more work, I think. We have tried to do some of this because obviously we know that there's many people in society that are not getting, you know, they're not taking up their full benefit entitlement. Um, so sometimes that's um, some work we can do there to make sure people are getting everything that they're entitled to. Um, in terms of the UK government, you know, obviously we've, for many years, have been trying to put pressure on the UK government to do certain things or to improve situations. And in some cases, we've been successful. But I'm sure you can imagine they're not always amenable to, you know, suggestions by government ministers, you know, coming from Scotland. So it's something we will continue to do. But ultimately, you know, the UK government will make its own decisions about these things and. There, I think there is a limited scope, really, for Scottish government intervention into what is UK policy decisions, which is another reason why I'm keen on us gaining all the full power so that we are responsible for making all of these decisions rather than relying on Westminster to make these decisions on our behalf. Thank you, Ash. So I'm going to jump ahead a few questions um, because uh, already I'm feeling the pressure of time. And I want to go to, to something that's probably as is equally important as, as the economy as social security and that's health and health inequalities which you, you've already mentioned um, we know that the gap in life expectancy is, is probably the, the most stark and damning illustration of the impact of poverty in Scotland um, we also know that that gap has widened recently um, and I think linked to that is the frankly scandal of, of Scotland's record on, on drug deaths which we know is amongst the worst in the world. So could you tell us what, what more as First Minister would you do to prioritise addressing, addressing that widening health gap and the issue of uh, drug deaths? And if I could go firstly to Hamzon. Thanks. And uh, obviously it's an issue that's close to all of our hearts, I suspect, but particularly mine's given uh, the current role uh, that I'm in. So for me, it's important that we really put um, the Christie Commission's words uh, into effect. And we've done that to some extent, of course, but we must build upon that and with urgency and with pace on the preventative uh, agenda. And we've had some success. So if I give you one example, um, we've made success and had success in relation to lung cancer, which we know is the most preventable cancer uh, in the country and, of course, affects people in areas of the highest deprivation. So we've had some uh, successes in terms of the earlier diagnosis uh, of lung cancer, but everything we do uh, is rooted in, 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 in trying to eradicate poverty. Because if we do that, of course, then we prevent people from having poorer health outcomes. And we know that's the case for that intersectionality point I was making, for example, for people with South Asian communities are more and, and, and who live in poverty are more likely uh, to, to, to have COPD, or diabetes. So how do we do that? Um, first and foremost, uh, for me, we invest in community healthcare. Uh, the only people that uh, I would hope would need to go to hospital, those busy acute sites that we have are those that desperately need acute care. We should be investing and continue to invest heavily in our community, uh, primary care and, and, and community facilities. And a great example of that is our community link workers and in, in, in GP practices across 
uh, the country and I want to build upon that and expand upon that because those community link workers will work with a number of organizations on this call and help to give people that holistic support so it's not just about the health support it's about the holistic support that they're able uh, to provide and for me on the drugs death uh, I, sorry the, second, the second, third point I wanted to make was on social care uh, want to continue our investment in, in social care and in the, those who work in social care and particularly to see what more we can do to increase their wages ultimately for me there's no NHS recovery without social care uh, if we get social care right in as broad as possible sense we prevent people from coming into uh, the, the healthcare system and hopefully get them discharged at the other end the very last thing sorry drugs deaths uh, because you mentioned it uh, I've given a, a bit of detail on this I won't go into all the details because I don't need to be brief uh, it will be a national mission for me if I'm first minister the drugs uh, Minister will report directly to the First Minister uh, and to me if I'm First Minister. I want to expand uh, the work on heroin assisted treatment. I want to continue to push the government, UK government, on safe consumption rooms. And we have to also link that work to alcohol misuse as, as, as well as drugs uh, and, and substance misuse uh, because we know our relationship with alcohol uh, is, is not a good one and we need to do further preventative work in that area. That's the best I could do in, in, in a nutshell, um, Peter. Thank you. And same question to Ash. Yeah, so I would agree as much of what Hamza said there, so I'll, I'll add a couple of different um, things just for variety. So, you know, healthy food and lifestyles, I think we all know nutrition is really important. If you're going to live a healthy life, you've got to eat nutritious food. And I think we do so well in Scotland in terms of the, you know, the food that we grow. So, um, but we're not so good at eating the stuff that we're growing in Scotland. So I think maybe there's a, a mis, misconnection there somewhere. And I think promoting um, that sort of understanding about healthy choices and cooking skills, perhaps with our young people to get people more used to using those sort of ingredients to make and cook and so on would be useful. Um, but in terms of, of drugs, I was reading an article by Anne-Marie Ward. Um, it was a couple of weeks ago now. Um, and she was making the point about um, you know, the mutual aid model. So I think LEAP is an example of that one. Um, and I have friends actually that are in recovery um, who didn't use that model specifically, but they did use the sort of peer-to-peer -peer support model. So AA is obviously a less formal um, version of that. And she was basically saying in that, that culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I thought it was quite a memorable line that was kind of really stayed with me. So I think I would like to find out a bit more if we're putting enough you know, investment into those type of programs because certainly when I was looking into this before, um, I had a lot of people come to me and they were basically, and I'll just put it in their words because this is how they expressed it to me, that they said that they felt that they'd been parked on methadone and they felt that they were going back into their GP and they were, they were sort of crying out for a route to move on. And yet there didn't seem to be, that didn't seem to be available to them, you know, that they weren't getting the response that they were hoping for. So I suppose, you know, we're sort of summing it up that we have to believe that recovery is possible in Scotland and we have to put that into everything that we do. And then I think we're going to see that we'll get better results as a result of that. Thank you, Ash. And finally, Kate. Thanks, Peter. In the interests of time, just to say that I agree with my, my colleagues and would commit to obviously the funding re re required in these matters, but could I identify just two specifics in, in this? Um, in terms of health inequalities, I think the key here is being able to support uh, children and uh, particularly support the role of health workers to prevent uh, the, the impact of poverty exacerbating the health inequalities that um, inevitably come from, from the impact of poverty. I think health vis visitors are probably the, the, the critical uh, um, health, work, health worker when it comes to trying to protect children uh, from the, the impact of poverty. And so I think continuing to support them and continuing to ensure that there's sufficient provision and ensuring that they are again uh, empowered to access other services when a family might need them or a mother might need them in particular or a child might need them and particularly when that child unfortunately needs to, to, to be taken into, into care, for example. So I'm just identifying one, one issue here. Um, and in terms of drug deaths, absolutely agree with the approach to the national mission. But again, just identifying one area that needs uh, addressed, and that is um, a rural uh, substance abuse. And the fact that too often we're expecting people 
to access help that are many, many miles away from where they live. And frankly, in rural areas, that just won't happen. You know, people are not going to uh, travel the miles to access help. We need to take the help to them, uh, the support to them. Uh, and that means that there needs to be the provision of uh, care, whether that's through rehab or it's it's the other forms of care uh, need to be provided in these rural communities. Thanks very much. Now, finally, we get to turn to some of uh, the participants that are on the call with us tonight. So I think I'm turning firstly to um, Caitlin from uh, One Parent Family Scotland. I think you have a question for us, Caitlin, if you want to unmute and uh, ask your question. Hi, um, I'm Caitlin Logan. I'm the Policy Research and Influencing Lead for One Parent Family Scotland. Um, thanks for taking my question. Uh, so whilst one in four children in Scotland are in relative poverty, this is significantly higher for some groups. For example, 39% of children with single parents and 55% of children with mums under 25 are in poverty. So what plans do each of the candidates have to take targeted action to reduce child poverty among the six priority groups in the Tackling Child Poverty Delivery Plan. Thanks very much, Caitlin. And I will go firstly this time, I'm starting to lose uh, track of who I've asked first last, but I'll go to Kate first on this one. Thank, thanks very much. So um, single parents are absolutely legendary in terms of what they have to uh, deal with to both, for example, hold down work as well as uh, raise children. Um, I am married to a man who raised uh, three ch three girls um, all on his own um, and knowing just how impossible that was gives me just a teeny weeny little insight into how um, horrendously difficult it is. I think there's two things I would say in response. Um, the first is that we need to make sure that there's adequate childcare provision. Uh, that there is um, affordable childcare provision because it is just impossible to uh, to work and also uh, to to look after children um, if there isn't that wraparound care. So it's no wonder then that mothers in particular reduce their hours um, or um, are, are are unable to to work full stop um, and quite clearly that that pushes them further into poverty. And the second thing is that the uh, support needs to be flexible enough. Again, when I think of most of the public services that are available to support families, it, many of them are inflexible. And therefore it's almost impossible for, again, a, a parent who's trying to work, look after kids to access the, the additional support that might be uh, available. So we need to provide uh, flexibility. So again, keeping it brief, I'm just picking up on one or two issues. I could We could probably discuss this for a full hour, thanks. Thanks very much, Kate. And uh, to Ash on this one. Yes, I'd agree with, with what Kate was saying there. I would I would add into that as well. If you think about people's main kind of costs, it would be usually be housing. So it'd be rent and then energy bills at the moment. So that's um, two of the areas where I've outlined um, a plan for um, doing things in a slightly different way. So obviously on the energy costs, you know, the national energy company, so we can get these bills right down because we know that Scotland at the moment is producing a lot of our um, cheap green energy, but we're not getting that reflected back in lower bills to Scottish customers because we're part of this U the UK grid. And obviously the way the energy market has been set up by the UK is meaning that it's much more expensive than it has to be. And especially if you look at that compared to some other European countries right now, you can really see the difference there. So I think that's something that needs to be urgently looked at. And the other one is, is obviously rental costs. So I've um, set out a plan for a, a, like a housing accelerator, the plan being to build a, a big programme of homes, but for public rent, um, but funded by the Scottish National Investment Bank. So the, the rents would be at a very low level. And, you know, they're not just for, you know, people at the lower end of the spectrum, it could be for everyone. And it just to give that um, access to good quality homes, but at a very affordable um, levels of rent. Thanks, Ash. And Hamza. So three things for me, and I agree with a lot of what my uh, colleagues have said here. So first and foremost, use the devolved powers we've got. 
and target them towards um, loan parent uh, families, uh, for example. Uh, and, and we can do that by, of course, using our tax powers, but also ensuring when it comes to, to childcare uh, costs and also school costs when it comes to free school meals, uh, of course, when it comes to school clothing, um, making sure, again, that is getting to the people that need it the most. And you've made a, Caitlin's made a very eloquent um, uh, 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 eloquent uh, point uh, around the particular inequality and poverty that affects one parent um, families. Um, so making sure that we continue to target those interventions using our devolved powers towards um, those that are in the greatest need. Second thing is ending the stigma. Um, I'm afraid to say still in 2023, not that you tell um, the, 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 the team at uh, one parent families, but still far too much stigma in our society, around poverty in general, but certainly around um, single parent um, families. So I'd like to do more work in relation to ending the stigma. The third thing is um, using whatever leverage we possibly can to uh, really uh, overturn some of the uh, retrograde uh, action that the UK government have taken. Uh, these are reserved issues, obviously, but I don't think we should give up um, trying to remove, for example, the two-child uh, limit, which uh, everybody on here uh, knows uh, well about. Uh, so those would be the three points I think I could hopefully like to focus on if I'm First Minister. Thanks very much. Um, I want to move on now to another question from uh, our participants, and this is uh, coming from uh, David from Shelter Scotland. Uh, and I should say this is this is a question that also represents uh, a variety of housing issues that have been brought up by um, uh, Kingsway Community Connections, Living Rent, Langstein Housing Association. So uh, over to you now, David, for the question. Uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's uh, David from Shelter Scotland here. Um, I want to ask, it kind of falls on from kind of what Ash um, touched on in the previous answer. Um, so there's 9,130 children trapped in temporary accommodation in Scotland, which is a record high, and there's an emerging risk of systemic failure in homelessness services. And that's according to the Scottish Housing Regulator. So what would candidates do to support those 9,130 children out of temporary accommodation, and what would they do to tackle Scotland's housing emergency? Thanks very much. And I will come to Ash first this time. Yeah, I mean, I represent Edinburgh and we have a real problem with families in, in often quite unsuitable um, temporary accommodation for longer periods than they should be in that type of accommodation. Now, clearly, as a government, you know, the Scottish government has prioritised building. We've built a lot of homes. Uh, we're certainly um, the part of the UK that's built more homes than, you know, the rest of the UK. But we can see that it is, still isn't enough and we still need to do more. So that's why I'm suggesting that we um, go a long way towards increasing supply and we create this new generation of, of houses for public rent, um, you know, high spec, providing secure accommodation, you know, where people can live in them long term. So I think sometimes in, in the private rental sector, it's quite unstable and you can find that you're getting moved on quite a lot. And, you know, if you're, um, you've got kids in school and you want to create that stability, um, we want to really have homes that people can, you know, move into and just know that they can be in there for the long term and they can um, put roots down in their community and so on. So, yeah, I would make that is one of my top priorities is to increase the housing supply with good quality, affordable housing. Thank you, Ash. And to Hamza next for this one. Yeah, so again, I mean, the, the, the solution has to be rooted in, uh, of course, uh, making sure that we build more affordable houses. We've got a good track record of that, over 100,000 uh, already by the SNP government. We've committed to 110,000 by 2032. That's £3.5 billion uh, commitment in the affordable housing uh, supply programme. Uh, for me, I've, I've made an announcement that uh, uh, as First Minister, uh, I would put £25 million pounds into uh, buying back empty homes and putting them into the social rented uh, sector, uh, not for private landlords uh, to use, as some other political parties have suggested uh, in their own commitments, but actually putting those empty homes uh, back into the social rented sector. Uh, that could be in urban areas, of course, but I think it will have a significant uh, a significant impact in, in, in rural Scotland, where we know housing is even more acute uh, than some parts, uh, urban areas uh, of uh, Scotland. I have also want to give local authorities the power to increase council tax on those uh, second homes 
uh, particularly holiday homes, again, uh, will not just impact in, in urban areas, but I think particularly have an impact in rural Scotland, where we know there are some significant challenges uh, around uh, around uh, affordable housing. So uh, a lot more, uh, certainly, I could say uh, around affordable housing. Thank you to Shelter for the work that they do. Um, but uh, clearly, uh, this has got to be a priority for whoever the next First Minister is. Thank you. And finally, Kate. Thanks uh, for that. Just um, three very quick points uh, for me. One is to is the fact that we do need to massively increase the supply of housing for social rent. Uh, as Hamza said, there has been a huge amount of uh, effort to increase the supply to date, but we know that more is needed. So continuing to prioritise capital spend on building um, housing for social rent. The second thing is around uh, ensuring that there are far easier processes by which to access uh, permanent housing uh, through uh, local authorities uh, in terms of that, particularly where there are children involved. And I think that needs to be um, as, as quick as possible, um, especially if that temporary housing is unsuitable, which is highly likely to be unsuitable. Um, and the last point uh, that I was going to make is around the, the quality of uh, temporary housing, which is um, too often uh, not at a level that is required in terms of overcrowding or in terms of the condition of the property. So ensuring that, that local authorities are maintaining the, the standard of accommodation, both temporary and permanent accommodation, um, so that you're not exacerbating the problems that families are facing and children are facing, particularly when we know, for example, that, um, the, 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 that um, unheated homes, uh, a lack of a, a appropriate um, uh, heating or uh, the quality in terms of mould and so on is actually um, having a hugely detrimental impact on children's health. Thank you, Kate. And now I think we're going to turn to um, Ruth from the Poverty Alliance, who's going to try and summarise maybe some issues coming up in the Q&A. So over to you, Ruth. And uh, for this question, we will go to Hamza first this time. Thank you, Peter. Yes, just to pick up, we've got lots of excellent questions in the chat as well, and apologies that we won't be able to pick up on all of those today. Um, picking up on Kate Forbes' earlier comments about targets and actions, we've got a comment from John McKendrick in the chat, which has highlighted that in his experiences, the targets that the Scottish Government has set, so around child poverty or poverty-related attainment, targets have actually driven action. And what he wants to know is whether your government will maintain the legislative, legislative commitments that have been made alongside wider aspirations in order to focus attention and drive action. I can be, I mean, can be really short in that answer and say yes, absolutely. I, I do believe that targets have a, a role to play. I see it in the health service and often, actually when I first came into the, the, the job as health secretary, um, I, I had a question around whether the targets were, were helpful or were they hindrance and the unequivocal answer actually from clinicians on the ground where they were helpful because they help us to drive towards uh, that ambition. Um, so, so absolutely commit to that uh, in terms of uh, our, 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 our uh, child poverty uh, action plan. I want my government, uh, if I am first minister, to be extremely ambitious. And this is the point uh, that I made in my opening uh, introduction. The relationship with the third sector is absolutely crucial and absolutely vital. Your job is to challenge us to push us, to tell us to go further. And I think it's really important, if I'm First Minister, certainly to listen to the third sector, have that relationship with them, where there is a bit of grit, where there is a bit of tension. Uh, and that's 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 no bad thing. But absolutely making sure um, that we that we deliver on those targets. And I think that is the key. You can have as many targets on a bit of paper as you want, or on a strategy, or on legislation. Um, but we've absolutely got to make sure uh, that we are uh, meeting those targets and being challenged on those targets. And just the last thing I'd say on that is, for me, a lot of this comes down to, to, we haven't talked about this too much, but comes down to local government funding and making sure that they are uh, adequately funded and making sure we give local government some flexibility in funding. I want to devolve um, more power to local government and, and actually beyond local government into, uh, as I say, the third sector, into communities, into community councils to help us to really drive those targets, uh, meet those targets and, 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 and make a difference when it comes to tackling poverty and inequality. Thanks. And to Kate. Thanks. So I do think we need to be setting ambitious targets, but often once the targets have been set, 
we think that that is a not obviously the people on this call but um, others can think that that is the hard work done but the target is just to focus the minds and ultimately the hard work still needs to be done it, my approach when it comes to tackling poverty is that it needs to pervade every aspect of government the public sector and society so it was one of the three objectives i've had in uh, most of the budgets i have set uh, because it needs to be a focus for uh, economic policy housing policy uh, the approach we take to health and I think it needs to run like a seam right through uh, all the policies uh, but the the ambition of the target does focus the minds. Thanks and finally Ash. Yeah I take on board what you're saying about that you feel in this instance the targets are driving action As for, and I know that what you measure matters I think we all understand and and take that on board but I think I've been looking more at targets that we've been setting in health, and I have had some feedback to suggest that perhaps that in some cases they don't work as we would like them to, and that actually they can sometimes be counterproductive and they can lead to unintended consequences. If people are focusing on one thing and then something else gets missed, which then creates problems elsewhere and it kind of goes around in circles. So I think we need to um, maybe um, bear that in mind when we're doing this. So I think my approach to this would be that we set out very clearly what the outcomes are that we're looking to get to, and we make sure they are sufficiently ambitious in what we want to achieve. And then with our, you know, our partners in government, then we all then can work out how we work towards delivering that change. So I think that's the way that I would want to achieve that. Thanks very much. And we'll go now to Claire Telfer from Save the Children. This will unfortunately be our last question so as we can get this one answered and then allow some time for the candidates to, to summarise their position. So over to you, Claire. Thanks very much, Peter, and good evening, everybody. My question relates to today's spring statement. So earlier today, the Chancellor announced the extension of childcare to some one and two-year-olds in England. If you were to become the next First Minister, how will you use the £320 million Barnet consequentials from this to build on progress to end child poverty in Scotland? Apologies, and that one goes to Ash firstly. Yes, I, I was pleased to see that myself when I saw that today. So I think that childcare would be a good place to um, look at spending some of this money. And then other money could go into targeted interventions like the Scottish Child Payment and the free school meals and so on. And that way you can target it um, straight into where it's needed the most. And then to Kate. Thanks. I think I would use it to uh, target the increase in costs that are plunging more families into deeper levels of poverty. So that uh, includes, for example, fuel insecurity. So we have a fuel insecurity fund, uh, but there are other routes to use that funding to try and mitigate some of the, the increased costs. Thanks. Uh, so for me, uh, I've made it a flagship policy of mine to accelerate the expansion of childcare to one and two year olds. So I would absolutely use that money. Um, and we know uh, that, that, that it is not an insignificant intervention in terms of cost. So I would use that money uh, to expand that childcare as soon as I possibly could. Uh, the reasons for that is that, of course, it helps families back into work. But thankfully, in a good way, disproportionately helps to get women back to work, which is absolutely required and needed. We have an untapped resource there that we are not fully utilising uh, here in Scotland. So I would absolutely use the money. I would also use it to work with the PVI sector who do say that they don't feel that the, 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 the funding is equitable and we can't do this without the PVI sector. So very, very keen to work with them and others around an equitable funding formula in relation to that. Uh, I've also made a commitment to uh, give a £500 loan. Now, I'd rather that was a payment, but of course, uh, the UK government uh, have not allowed us uh, to do that. But, but, but a, but a £500 loan that could be paid back at the end of a child's childcare journey in order to help with those initial upfront costs, which we know it can be prohibitive to accessing childcare for a parent. So I would use the money uh, in, in, in that way. Thank you, Hamza. Um, I'm, I'm going to contradict myself and I'm going to ask you one very rapid fire question at the end here. Hopefully you can give me a, an almost yes or no answer. Um, so this is from the STUC Women's Committee, but also from Scottish Youth Parliament, Magic Breakfast and, and various others. So they're asking, and if you could be brief, 
Um, could you tell us, would you commit to accelerating the expansion of universal free school meals to all primary pupils? And further, would you commit to expanding this offer uh, and provision to all secondary school pupils in Scotland? And I'll start this time with Kate. So I'd be very supportive of that approach, but I would also caveat that by saying that the funding needs to be used in a way that most targets the root causes of child poverty. Now, if that is, is food, then we focus on expanding free school meals. If there are other routes, for example, the Scottish Child Payment, then with limited funding, I think we need to invest it in the approach that deals with poverty in the most effective way possible. Thank you. And Hamza? So uh, in, 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 in short, uh, yes, I would absolutely be open to that ambition because we know how important free school meals for all are, uh, both in terms of making sure our children uh, are, are, are fed and, and, and well fed uh, before their educational journey and during their educational journey, but also in terms of ending stigma. But I, I, I agree a lot with what Kate has said. Um, I think we also need to look at how we, particularly with limited finance, target that funding, particularly towards those that need it the most. So sorry, not a yes or no, but as short as I possibly could. Thank you. And Ash? Yeah, I think I'm going to join with my colleagues there and say that I'm very open to looking at whether this is the best approach. Uh, and it may well be. And if that is the case, then I, I would commit to doing it. But if there's other interventions that might get us closer to where we want to be in this, but um, it would also look at them. So, yeah, that's not really a yes or no answer either. Thank you. So um, that's us at the, the end of our, our questions. We've now got um, just a, a minute and a half to maximum two minutes for each of the candidates just to, to, to remind us why they should be the next First Minister and why they are best placed to help address poverty and inequality in Scotland. And I'm going to start uh, with Hamza, then go to Ash and then finish with Kate. So, Look, I, I think I can be really brief because it's been a really good discussion and we could have been speaking all night uh, and, and I'm happy to engage with as many organisations as I possibly can in doing this campaign and thereafter. And I just want to give you an absolute commitment. Obviously, I'm in this contest uh, to win it and I look, uh, would uh, love to be the next leader, the, uh, the next First Minister uh, come uh, the 27th of March. But I can give you an absolute commitment, whatever my role is in, in Scottish public life, uh, you have an open door with me uh, to engage with me, to challenge me. Uh, uh, I, uh, my, my driving mission in, in, in public life is to try to not just reduce but eradicate poverty where I can because it is the root of the, all of the challenges uh, that we face as a government. So I've laid out my stall in terms of progressive taxation, wellbeing economy. I won't rehearse all of that, uh, but given Peter's instruction to be quick, um, my doors are very open one, whether it's during this election contest or indeed thereafter. I look forward to engaging with as many of you as possible. Thank you. Ash. Yeah, so just to um, reiterate what I'm saying, and many of it I covered in my opening statement in my first answer, but I do believe we need to look really seriously look at reforming the economy. I don't think that that is going to give us the results we want if we don't do that. We need to direct and shape it towards those high paying jobs and promote that domestic ownership, because I think that's going to be key in this. Invest in those industries that are going to create the supply chain and um, support those high paying jobs. So that would be like renewables. And for me, um, increasing the housing supply with good quality, low cost, secure housing for people. And then in terms of mitigations, which I spoke, at the, I spoke about at the beginning, um, that I would really like to work with um, the Poverty Alliance to look at what, what is the optimum package um, of mitigations and what that might look like. Um, so um, if I was First Minister, I'd be very keen to be looking at that within the first 100 days. Thank you. Finally, Kate. Thanks very much. Well, I believe that the only way that we are going to eradicate poverty in Scotland is actually if we work uh, very collaboratively together. So it's incumbent on uh, organisations like those represented here today to continue to hold uh, our feet to the fire and also to um, advise and inform and guide when it comes to uh, policies that actually work. So you said to sum up as to why either, either of us would be the best uh, First Minister. I'm not going to say that. I am going to say, however, that whoever of us is elected, I will certainly be continuing to do everything I can to use my political office and uh, responsibilities to try and further the work 
to eradicate child poverty. It's work I've been doing in the Highlands uh, before I was in, in, in ministerial office, and I've been trying to make uh, eradicating uh, poverty, certainly child poverty, a key mission in, in all budgets. So I will be continuing to do that work um, in collaboration uh, with uh, organisations like yourselves and individuals who are keen uh, and see uh, the outrage that it is that too many children are in poverty and the, the age expectancy is far too wide between the least deprived and the most deprived. So there are deep social economic inequalities in Scotland. We have to uh, eradicate them. We can eradicate them. They are not inevitable. We can do it together, whichever of us is First Minister. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate, and thank you to all of our candidates for your inputs tonight. Um, just to say, we will try and summarise as many of the questions we didn't get to, and whoever takes up the post, we'll make sure that you uh, receive a copy of some of these questions and you start working through them then. I'm going to hand back to Jim McCormick now uh, for some final closing reflections. Over to you, Jim. Thanks very much. Peter, well, this is not exactly the green room and the journalists post-match analysis, but I'll do my best to make three points briefly in three minutes um, and preface it by saying, of course, thank you to all of you candidates for spending time with us this evening <clears throat> and engaging in a constructive and really in-depth debate um, about how we build solutions to poverty and inequality beyond where we are already. So my three points are going to be <clears throat> who needs to be involved, how they need to be involved and how we know we're making progress briefly, who, well, self-evidently it is government, governments at all levels, maximising their powers, including their powers of influence, uh, aligned to the most powerful things we can do to solve poverty. <clears throat> but I don't think government can do this on its own. I think we need to expect more and engage better with different sectors of the economy and um, with employers in particular and with other forms of economic power. I think economic justice has to go hand in hand with our approaches to. Um, solving poverty. Um, housing providers we talked about this evening, a reset on the environment for maximising affordability of housing in all sectors, all tenures, has to be um, part of what we do next. And whether we call it the third sector or the social sector or the voluntary sector, um, we know that all is not well across Scotland in terms of funding security, in terms of party of esteem, and that has to be changed in uh, uh, soon if we are to maintain capacity uh, in the sector. Secondly, and briefly, how? Well, I think we've learned a lot, certainly through the pandemic and since, but even before that, about power. Um, we've learned that um, if we rely upon just joining up public services and better data and the performance framework, uh, Scotland performs and all, all that infrastructure of government. Well, why would we expect to be here in a few years time with radically different profile in poverty? I think uh, the parts of the conversation tonight about shifting power locally, um, our take on that would be to families and communities, not just to local governments and other public bodies. There's a great deal that's promising about micro grants to families direct to build their own solutions where complex public services have failed to find solutions. We know that people in poverty tell us they are exhausted about being passed from pillar to post, shunted, telling their story, being referred, being assessed multiple times over and still not moving forward in terms of their life chances. Um, we need to do much better. And our progress in the next decade on Christie's vision of prevention, we cannot afford it to be glacial, as we are told it has been in the last decade. And finally, how we know 
I think some litmus tests have emerged from this conversation um, <clears throat> and some points that have not come up tonight. And to my mind, how we know we're doing it differently and better and making progress, I think we would see this through the lens of disabled people and carers. Um, we don't have a whole population approach to solving poverty. We need to have that. Uh, care wages have been talked about tonight. What's happening with wages in the care sector, as well as incomes for unpaid carers, would be a litmus test. Turning the tide on drugs deaths, we've talked about that tonight, but also the hard edges of offending, multiple exclusion, homelessness, and so on. Um, uh, it's a metric that's gone the wrong way for 20 years. There aren't many of those. And finally, I think it's appropriate to end on this point, our progress in delivering on the promise in Scotland, because so much of what we're talking about tonight is experienced and crystallised so much for those who experience the care system. We've made bold commitments around the promise. We must hold on to them and deliver them with boldness, ambition, and alongside people with first-hand experience. We've gone over by three minutes. I do apologise. We started a bit late. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I think in place of fear, there has been hope in this conversation. I want to thank my colleagues, Cassie, Paul, Haley, Russell, who've done so much to bring this together, along with Ruth, Peter, and their colleagues at Poverty Alliance. Um, and thank you to, again, to all of our colleagues. We wish you well. We'll be watching with interest, and I hope you know in our sector you have critical friends and allies waiting to help deliver on the commitment that's been present in this conversation this evening. Thank you very much. Stay well. Thank you for all you do collectively on our vision of ending poverty in Scotland. Thank you and good night. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.